You guys live uh, now. <laughs> right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Right. Just give everybody a little minute to join on. Hi, everyone who's joining. Just going to make sure that we are live. Let's just see and make sure that we are live and kicking because it's our very, very first one. So we're all good. Okay. Put two viewers. Right, people are starting to get in. I'll get some more music going. Get everyone in and just get everyone all nicely pumped up. Hi, Jeb. That's all good. Hi, everyone. Hi, guys. Hope everyone's having a lovely, lovely Wednesday. Welcome to the very first Frank and Jelly's Training and Behavioural Hour with the legend that is Mr. Bruce Whitelaw. Hello, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So, everybody, right, so we've had so many questions on the Facebook group regarding training and behavioural advice. We're super excited to invite Bruce as part of the Frank and Jelly's team specialising in training and behavioural. So he's the person to give you the very, very best advice. Bruce is qualified dog trainer with over three and a half thousand hours worth of dog experience. Like me, he likes all things holistic. A little fun fact about me and Bruce is we're both diehard Dr. Karen Becker fans. Yes. So Dr. Baron Becker she fans. Has, has cheek. Cheek. All right. Okay. Rub it in. Rub it in. Rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> So the way we're going to make it work today, guys, is we are going to go through some of the questions that we had on our events. We're going to go through some questions that we had by our email. And then if we've got some time, I'm going to do some more Q&A. So if you guys can all hear me, can you give me a little thumbs up, just a little chat so we know who we've got here? Um, I know there's some people saying they can't see properly. That might be just something that you are guys having a problem with. But like, we're just going to go on. Right, just bear with me now. Right, I'm just pulling up the very first of our questions. Okay, so today we're going to do a bit of a theme for you guys. A lot of the questions were coming in about like slight aggression and also um, barking issues. I would like to say as a disclaimer, obviously the advice we're giving on, on the behavioral and training hour is general advice. Um, if we see things or comments where we think that you guys are at risk case, you will be contacted separately. We always recommend working with dog trainers personally. Bruce is our go-to guy. Um, if any of you are wanting to talk with Bruce on a one-to-one -one basis via Skype, he does have that available to you. So you just need to email us, info at frankandjellies.com, and we will put you in touch with Bruce Direct, okay? So let's get started. So the first question is coming to us um, tonight from Sarah, another Sarah Robinson, would you believe? Right, and I'm just pulling up that question now. Bear with me a minute. Good old technical Facebook. <laughs> Exactly when you want it not to do what you want, yeah. it's there. Okay, and I know she has a very, very beautiful collie that she wanted some help with. So just bear with you me. That um, source and say that just like to quickly say thank you very much. For them. It's always me, isn't it, Bruce? Always me that <laughs> comes on and then suddenly can't find what I'm looking for. So yeah. the first question tonight is coming from us from Sarah Robinson, which was posted inside the Frank and Jelly's event. So, Bruce, the question that comes from Sarah Robinson is, my one-year-old uh, border collie barks and lunges towards people when on a leash. Okay. But off in public, he doesn't do this. When in the garden, he does the same thing and runs to the fence and barks until they pass. Any tips would be great. So what would you say to Sarah? I think this is quite common for uh, quite a few dog owners. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... the. So oh, I think I've lost you. Have you gone mute? <laughs> Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It was my end. Don't worry. Oh, there right. you go. All oh, right. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, 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 so first of all, then, just to join the garden. So, so, the way dogs learn through associations and through consequences of their behaviour. So, what happens is essentially, so your dog's sitting in the garden watching everything that's going by all day 
like sitting in a window that a lot of dogs bark at as well. That's live TV for dogs. So what happens is your dog spots somebody walking along the street. They start barking at them. That person keeps walking. What the, the, the message that that sends to the dog is, you've done your job. That behaviour is then reinforced or rewarded because the person carries on walking. So they, they don't make the assumption that the person was going to continue walking anyway. That's just the way dogs learn. Uh, so it's the direct consequence of their behaviour. So the, the first of all, the best thing that you can do is stop letting... So the best thing Sarah can do is stop letting our, um, our, our dog have kind of unlimited access and, and unsupervised access to the garden because every time a, a, a what's called an undesirable behaviour is um, practised, it's then reinforced and it's more likely to happen again and again and again. So every time the uh, our collie's out the back and he barks at somebody walking past, it's more likely to happen. So the first of all, we need to stop him having that unsupervised access. Um, secondly, what I would want to do is uh, start. Start getting them to do more appropriate things out in the garden. One one thing that's really uh, can work help help a lot with the, with these types of behaviours, particularly if the dogs spend a good part of their life per performing this um, or chasing people away, essentially ch trying to chase them away from the garden. Um, one really good thing that people can do is actually start to um, scatter feed their dog out the back. So it's. Okay. Like, encouraging the dog to search, hunt and, and look about for their food, giving them an, an alternative thing to do. So that's just one wee, one wee tip to, to look at, um, uh, to, to start with. And then once you get them out of that habit, we would then start to essentially reinforce some quiet behaviour. So you're out there with your dog, your dog sees somebody coming down, before they start barking, you start feeding them one treat after the other, and you do that quite continuously until the person walks past the door. Um, so it's good if you can get, um, we call them a stooge, a helper, whatever you want to call them, somebody that can actually come to your house and um, walk to and fro, back and forward past your garden. Uh, that will help you loads. Okay, brilliant. So what would you say, just because I know there's some other members, with, it's a very, very similar topic, so you hope you don't mind me diving into this. If my dog was doing that at the window of the house, you know, if I'm a raw feeder, I don't want to necessarily scatter feed in my living room. <laughs> yeah, um, that's different. That could get a bit smelly if they miss a bit. Um, what, would you, what would you recommend in that instance? Okay, so again, the, 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 the living room window is the worst part. That is... That is, um, again, it's like, that is literally like live TV for your dog. And it's the, it's the same, this, exactly the same idea. So somebody walks towards the window, the dog barks, they keep walking, the dog thinks, I made that person bugger off. Yeah, I'm king of the castle, you got out of my area. I made that happen. That's the way that they learn. So it's the same sort of thing. Avoiding that unrestricted access to looking out the window. Um, so a lot of people uh, have maybe have a, a, a couch or something like that sitting in front of their window, which is an, ex an excellent platform for dogs to sit and look out, but it's also an excellent platform for them to sit and bark all day long. And that, that's not healthy. Um, so moving, if it's, if it's possible, you know, if it's practical, moving furniture to stop the dogs having that um, such a, 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 a kind of, such a brilliant view of the window. There's other great things that you, you can use. Um, I think a, a lot of craft shops, they do this um, kind of film that you put over your window. So it's uh, so it almost looks like kind of frosted glass, but it's, it's, it's like just a sticky sheet. Uh, so you can so put that up. This is just temp a temporary fix, but you put that up so you're not having to close curtains and blinds and all yeah. the things because nobody wants to be sitting in a dark room. But, you know, you make it so that it's like, so that the dog hasn't, uh, can't see as well out the window and then gradually removing strips of it over a period of uh, maybe a few weeks to a couple of months and gradually increasing what they're seeing outside the window and doing the same sort of thing again, having to practice, somebody walking past, as soon as your dog spots them, we start feeding them and then as the person... Uh, once the person stops uh, or has walked past, then we stop and just rinse and repeat over and over. 
Okay, brilliant. And if anybody needs any advice as to the, the, the products that Frank and Jay's probably would recommend in this instance, I personally love for my dogs the Love Hearts liver treats because they're just so small and yeah. smoke so moorish. I would like, you know, when I'm trying to do recall in the park, I literally just drop them. So that's brilliant. Thank you, Bruce. Excellent. Um, and just good to say quickly as well, because um, one thing that um, particularly barking at the window, it can be, so being a very much a, a, a kind of a holistic dog trainer, we need to look at, rather than just looking at the specific behaviours, looking at any potential underlying issues that might be causing it. So exit, dogs bark, that's what they do, it's totally natural, but when it's excessive and it's becoming incessant, it can sometimes be an indication of an underlying, um, maybe a bit of a, uh, Boredom, lack in mental stimulation. So puzzle feeders are the best way forward. Is another. I, I recommend changing how your dog is fed. I recommend that to every one of my clients, regardless of what we're working on. Um, because if your dog's mentally stimulated, they're less likely to start developing behaviour issues. Or it'll help you change them. So something like in your living room, like a, a snuffle mat is ideal in there. It's giving the dog an opportunity to hunt for their food a little bit, actually work a wee bit more to get it, and it's making them think. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much, Bruce. I think that's going to help so many people on here that have been asking about Hopefully. barking. Yeah, no, it will. It absolutely will. If I can take the next question now for Leslie Perry, who emailed in first. So Leslie said, hi, Bruce, I'd like to ask a question. I have an 18-month-old Sharpe. He's always been very friendly with other dogs, boisterous mm -hmm. on and off the lead, but always wanted to play until a couple of months ago. Now he sniffs and snaps aggressively, but if he's with the dog walker, he's perfectly well behaved with every new dog he meets. It's really becoming a problem. And as she notes that he was actually muted at 10 months. Okay, okay. So the so we've got Les, so Leslie here, 18 month uh, Sharpie. Um, so first of all, it's interesting the fact that the the dog is fine when out with the dog walker, and I'm assuming the majority of that time he, he's out there, he's pr probably off leader on a long line, and he's getting a lot more freedom. Um, a lot of the time, the the, the the type of lead that we use can cause an issue when we're walking our dogs, particularly um, flexi leads, for example, they can cause a lot of a feeling of tension and restriction in the dog. And that can cause, when the dog's feeling restricted like that, um, there, it can cause them to, to, to react the way they do to other dogs or even uh, people, for example. Um, so... If, the, if he's off lead when he's with Leslie and he's absolutely fine, then that's more of an indication. That's an indication that it is a quite. Um, you're, you're Sorry, the other way around, bro. Sorry to interrupt you. The, yeah. He's perfectly fine with the dog walker. It's yeah. when he's with Leslie that he's misbehaving. It's when he's so Leslie, okay. Did, did okay. that be he feels her anxiety or absolutely yeah that's what i was going to touch on next um, so it's another thing that that uh, makes a uh, it's a uh, has a massive impact and it's so we've known for years that dogs can can sense when we are uptight or stressed or scared or whatever um but it's only uh, we we always we we we've spoke about it being more kind of visual cues from us so you know a white knuckle grip on a lead is obviously a, an indication that we are scared or um or kind of scrunched up shoulders these kind of things but a study towards the end of the last year says that dogs basically dogs can uh, can can smell that stress off us as well through our our uh, hormonal changes in our body and um, so the one of the best things that uh, a that, that leslie can do is actually learn some techniques for herself to help keep herself calm when she's out a walk. Most good dog trainers and behaviour consultants will work with their clients to to, uh, to address these issues as well. So as well as just looking at because a lot of the time, not, maybe not a lot of the time, but uh, um, a good percentage of the time uh, when uh, our dog's issues are 
can be based. I think uh, on what we are feeling. I think Leslie's case is a very typical example of that. Um, so I think it'll be imperative for her to get some uh, to get some techniques to help her just relax and chill out a wee bit more. Another thing is quite often I find is with clients like Leslie, is it takes one session for me to show them how to handle the lead and to actually show them your dog's not a psychopath. They're just worried <laughs> because you're just worried, you know, <laughs> and sometimes that's just enough to set them both to make the owner think, oh my God, this is awesome. That's fine. So then they can they can cope. And uh, what I would probably suggest as well, actually, is um, sorry, my battery, my phone. Yeah, um, is go is uh, maybe Leslie actually making a point of going out with her dog walker so that she can see her dog interacting with other dogs and and potentially get some hints and tips from him on handling as well. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so Leslie, if you're watching this, obviously some great advice from Bruce. And if you would want to have a further conversation with Bruce, just info, uh, email us at info at Frank and Jelly's and we'll put you in touch with Bruce. Maybe you can do something, Bruce, via Skype where she can show yeah. you. Uh, mobile devices have all got Skype. The more, you know, distance isn't, shouldn't be an issue. No. Okay, so can I just take a question from the group? Because I just saw a really, really good one here. I'm kind of throwing you a little bit of a curveball here, Bruce. Oh, thanks. So, okay dog product review group so any suggestions for techniques to stop our dogs stealing things and not giving them back any stimulation type games and they have caveated that would say that they uh they minimize the chance of him getting hold of things but usually it's things like a receipt or a wrapper yeah yeah okay i know because that's that's the thing it's, it's always our first our first day protocol is to um manage dogs environment so they're not getting the opportunity but you walk in the door you throw your jacket off something falls out the pocket these things happen so what i what i recommend uh, for, for for this type of issue is uh, something that i've had a lot of success with is actually teaching the dog to retrieve so um so it's obviously it's particularly effective with dogs like spaniels labradors a lot of gun dogs but i've um I've, uh, I've done it with a bulldog, so it's, uh, so what we do... Wow, is... you can get my dog to actually retrieve something. You <laughs> it is entirely possible, um, and it's really, it's, it's a really fun thing to do as well. Um, but if, so we get, because the thing is, we are not able to stop just dropping stuff all the time. You know, that's not going to happen. So what, we, can, we can work to teach the dog to ignore anything that's dropped, but that can be a bit time consuming and a bit bit a bit tedious. I prefer think a far more fun technique to do is teach your dog to retrieve something and bring it to you. So um whether that be uh uh, so a receipt, so, you know, using things that are, aren't going to be harmful to your dog. Um, but, you know, it's not it's not going to be the end of the world if they do get a wee bit, if they do swallow a wee bit or something like that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a really, really fun thing to do. There's um, a, a, just a, a, well, pro, a, I can certainly do a, a kind of video demo myself one uh, sometime to, to, to show the specifics. Uh, but if you have a look on YouTube, there's um, uh, loads of videos on there to teach you how to, how to, to get your dog to retrieve. But that... I'll set you a little challenge, Bruce. I want to see that video demo yeah. of you the bulldog to okay. retrieve. Right. That's your challenge if you choose right. to accept it. Challenge accepted. I'll need, a, I'll need a, a Scottish Bulldog volunteer, please. If anybody wants to um, volunteer, that would be great. I'd be very grateful. <laughs> Shout out to all our Bulldogs based yeah. in Scotland. Brilliant. We'll go to another question, if that's all right, because I'm just yeah. mindful of time. So, um, Cass Burke on our event said, our one-year-old French Bulldog is not the most well-behaved, loves to bark at our other dog and any other dog we meet. It's not aggressive, but more playful. He's getting better with his toileting, but cannot quite grasp not toileting in the kitchen. We've tried treats, praise, and simply putting outside. He'll go on walks and even come home and want to go in the garden to wee. He's now taken to eating and ripping up dog pads. I came home yesterday and he destroyed one of his beds. He's got the tendency to scratch like digging, especially once when he wants to play or for attention. What would you say to Cass? Okay, so to, sorry, was that Cass? Cass. 
Cass. K C A S S. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Cass. And um, uh, so, few different things to look at here. Then, so first of all, the toileting. This is quite a common thing um, in dogs that are adolescent age, which is it's still a French one-year-old French bulldog is still a, a, an adolescent, um, essentially a stroppy hormonal teenager. So. <laughs> What we get is, um, so, and it happens quite commonly, and I notice it more often in dogs that have been puppy pad trained in the house. Um, but what happens is, so the dog gets to, we, we think we've nailed the toilet training when they're a puppy. Um, so they're peeing and they're pooing outside regularly. But then the dog reaches adolescence, and that's when they start scent marking behaviour. So instead of peeing for relief, it's two completely different things. So it's the same action, but the motivation behind it is completely different. So um, scent marking for, for is, is, commun is more com for communication. Um, so, what we, so what we want to do is essentially going right back to basics and that's reinforcing or rewarding, uh, rewarding the dog every single time. Every time he lifts his leg outside, we reward that behaviour. A lot of people, they fall into a trap of, so the dog will pee out in the garden, they'll then... The, the, the owners will then get the dog, take the dog into the kitchen, then give them the treat. That's too long a gap between the behaviour and the reward. <laughs> so the reward needs to happen within about three seconds of the behaviour for the dog to make that association. So the best thing that you can do is if you're, you're out with your dog, make sure you've always got treats handy. As soon as he's, if he lifts his leg, as soon as it's back down, immediately good boy and give him a wee treat right away, loads of praise. Um, Another thing that a lot of people do is they ask their dog for a sit. So, and what I say to my clients is pay your dog for the job that they've just done. Don't ask them to do something else, okay? Oh, so, okay. Very interesting, because I've yeah. made that right mistake. Okay, cool. It's, so, it's really, really common, and it's a... a, a um, we, we, I, see it, I see it every day. So we've got um, dogs working on recall. The dog does an awesome recall away from a big group of dogs, and... They come to the client, the client then asks them to sit. And the dog's like, Jesus, just give me my treat here. This is what I did. <laughs> what do you mean? Or it's sit, paw, stay, everything else. And that's fine later on. But for, when we're just trying to get the basics down, we need to be re rewarding the behaviour immediately after. <laughs> um, oh, and uh, and as again, again, as I say, every single time he lifts his leg outdoors as well. So just keeping a wee eye on him. Okay, that's really good advice because I'll be honest with you guys, everyone watching. That's something my husband does. Like he will he when the, the say, like, well, he would. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, he would be out the door. No, um, <laughs> he, he he often he that's something we do wrong. Like when we're trying to praise the dogs, he always put the dogs in a sit and then a down position before yeah. he gives the dog a treat. So I'll be definitely educating. Um, yeah, and that, Edu as I say, that's. It's, it's good to be able to do that. It's great doing it uh, uh, and later on. Um, but just when you're looking for a specific behaviour from the dog um, or you're working with a behaviour problem, just pay the dog immediately for the thing that they've just done for you. Okay, brilliant. We've got time for a few more questions before we go to the people on the line. Um, we just want to say, just, uh, again, quickly for Cass. So the dog... Um, uh, I'll touch on this one briefly. There's probably a lot of people that have this type of issue as well with the French bulldog. He's um, kind of quite barky towards other dogs and uh, more in a, in a, um, the motivation behind that uh, seems to be more playful as opposed to wanting to tell the dogs to go away. Um, so one th what, have, keep him on, on a long line until he learns some manners. So stopping him from performing the undesirable behaviour, which is running up to dogs and barking. Um, the other thing is, and actually not allowing them permission to go to the other dogs and uh, while, while he's barking at them as well. Um, it's, it's not as just as straightforward as, as that, but it's a start, you know, uh, so it's a start for or something to consider there as well. Okay, brilliant. I think that's really good advice. Cass, if you are listening, obviously let us know that you have got that advice. Um, so I wanted to ask, we've got an email from Anne Horn on email. Um, my fur baby Nelly is very frightened and jumpy of any noises. She comes charging in, barking and growling. Any noise spooks her. You move boxes or a vacuum cleaner and she's a nightmare. Starting to get past the door to go outside. She's out with, she's a little hesitant, but will walk to the car. Loves her walks and runs around with other dogs. 
I have MS and my husband has had a stroke, so we can't walk her anymore, but we have a dog walker who takes her out for yes. an hour. But it's got so bad that she won't go in the dog walker's van. So my husband has to take her in the car and bring her back in. It's quite a lengthy post, but I kind of see yeah. kind of the highlights. What would you kind of advise to Anne Horn? I'm sorry, one second, I'm just going to turn the light on. Yeah, it's getting a bit dark in here, guys. This is the first time for us. Yeah, Glasgow's getting a bit dark now. Um, so, uh, so Anne, yeah, um, it sounds to me like uh, Nelly's suffering from some general kind of anxiety. Um, so lots of things that we would want to be doing with her is increasing uh, lots of mental stimulation. Any sort of training that you can do with her daily um, can make a massive, massive difference. So if you can spend 15 minutes each day with with Nelly, um, teaching her a new behaviour um, or, or a new trick essentially can make a massive difference. Also looking at alternatives for feeding her, um, so ditching your food dish and uh, opting for something like a snuffle mat. Um, or the other, uh, uh, Frank and Jellies have some some other awesome options available. Um, so and and getting her getting her to to uh, to do something for her food, use her brain that can help really really help build her confidence because we're teaching her problem solving skills. Um, and if a dog can work out how to solve an issue, how to solve, how to problem solve, it can be a massive confidence booster because they think, oh my God, I made that happen. You know, so um, I was I was faced with a challenge and I made, I, I made, uh, uh, and I changed the outcome there. So and that sort of thing can be really, really massively uh, boosting a dog's confidence. Um, the other things I would think to consider is the... Um, the pet remedy plug in as well because we want her to. It sounds like she's generally kind of in a state of being quite anxious and nervous all the time. And if you, th you know, you can imagine if a period where you're having a particular bad time and you're you're, you're struggling to to feel normal. And um, it sounds like Nelly's kind of got that quite prolonged quite constant in her life. So we want to be using uh, using whatever natural uh, remedies we can to, to bring her, just help her chill out a wee bit. Um, another great thing that we do is uh, the Tableton Tea Touch. On uh, We do the ear tea touches, which are massively, really, really helpful in uh, bringing the dogs, um, uh, re reducing their heart rate and uh, their, uh, helping them breathe a bit more normally again. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get one of my dogs in a wee second and I'll show you how we do the the, the Tellington T-Touch ear touch, um, but it's what the, the ear is connected to various different points in the body, um, sort of various, various different systems in the body, so it really helps with relaxation and calming, and it it's, can be really good during uh, fireworks and things like that as well. So I would sort that out first, get her feeling a little bit more calm and less, uh, sorry, more confident, less jumpy around various different triggers, and then look at... Um, Getting her look at working with her for, for going in and out of the dog walker's van. Now we need to take it steps with for Nelly. Okay, and I know Anne's just asked a question about whether or not it's something that's available. It's actually something we spent a lot of time testing. I'm a big fan of pet remedy plugins. Not only do they last about eight weeks, they're, they're natural and they're cost effective for the owners. It's something you can just plug in and go. And we will obviously send you the details of where you can purchase it. And yeah, thank you, Bruce, because the last thing you want to do is be medicating the dogs when they don't need to be. Absolutely. Um, that sounds really, really good. Okay, um, we're good for another couple of questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. So this is one that I'm interested in as well, actually. Okay. Uh, but not for now, so there's no special announcement, but it's something in the future. So Helen Boardman on our event asked, Bailey, the three-year-old black lab, tends to jump up at me when he, I get his harness out ready for walks. And he can be a jealous boy at times who loves to snuggle up to me in the evenings, which is nice, except I've just found out I'm pregnant. How do I stop him jumping up at me, especially as my belly grows? And what is the best way to introduce the baby when it's time? Okay. Um, so it's, it's awesome that you're thinking about this just now. Um, so it was uh, Helen, wasn't it? Yeah. Helen, it's it's awesome. Awesome that you're thinking about this just now because so many people um, wait until they don't. They maybe think about it last minute, 
or they don't actually consider the, what the dog's going to react, like a, how the dog's going to feel at all with a new baby coming along. And it's a, just as big a change for them as it is for us. So that's awesome, really proactive. Um, so what I would start to do is... We, we so we want to teach him. We want to teach Bailey that the good stuff happens when all four paws are on the floor, um, rather than when the paws are up on on pregnant mum. And um, so a really really simple exercise that you can do with, to do to teach that behaviour. Excuse me, Sarah. This will be another one that I'll do a um, I'll do a video for us for as well. Okay. Um, so uh, how to help with dogs that jump up. Um, so what you want to do is you want to so have a a treat bag, handy, um, with some nice, uh, so so good loaded, nice tasty treats in there. Um, and what I want you to, what we do is we throw one, throw a piece of food away, so that Bailey has to run away from you. As Bailey's en route back to you, when he's maybe about three, two or three feet away from you, say good boy, and immediately throw up another piece of food away from him. So every time he's bounding back, he's getting to here, then he's immediately having to about turn and go away. So once, what we should notice is uh, eventually Bailey starts to bound up and he'll stop there in anticipation for the good boy coming ah. and then the piece of food going, getting thrown back away. Once we get to this point, we can start feeding them right in front of, them, of, of us as well. So it's just teaching them, and we do that with everybody that comes into the house. We need to make sure that everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet to make it as quick and as smooth as uh, uh, um, a smooth a transition as possible for Helen, um, and uh, and she needs to be blunt with people coming in. I mean, I'll be honest. I go home and I see my dogs. Are, ah, Daddy's home, and they're all over me. I don't care, but I'm never going to be pregnant or anything. So, I'd, um, it's it's not an issue. And anybody that comes into my house is um, generally crazy dog folk anyway. So, yes. uh, but I can totally appreciate why, uh, why uh, the, the, the need for Helen. So, um, but yeah, it's just saying to everybody that they need to listen to her because if they don't, she's the one that's got to deal with a, with a, a big bouncy lab jumping up on her when she's having a, when she's um, nine, uh, eight months pregnant, ready to go in, in a few weeks time. It's not ideal. So just be strict yeah. with friends and family that are coming into your house. Um, is it, and what I would su su suggest doing is having a wee look on uh, different baby sounds and uh, activities on, on on YouTube. It's a great source for anything that, uh, that might be scary or potentially unnerving for dogs. So looking for, for videos of babies crying on a loop, that sort of thing, just gradually exposing them to all these different things, making sure that he's ready for um, for these ho potentially horrible noises when the baby comes home um, before it's, he's actually in a situation where the baby is here and there's not much we can do about it. We can give him a gradual exposure. Uh, to these things. Also making sure that he's in a routine with walks and feeding, uh, all these kind of things, getting him into quite a structured routine, um, it will really, really help. The more independent that he is, like for example, being able to take himself off to his crate or his bed and lie there and chew on a bone or a kong or um, some, uh, or some kind of natural treats like that, uh, anything any of these things that are just going to that will help build a little bit of independence in Bailey will make a massive difference. Make just make things a bit easier for you. If you ever read the book, um, How to Tell Your Dog You're Pregnant, it actually comes with a CD of those, and it actually turn it up. Read it. Yeah, it's it's quite a good one. It might be one for uh, for Helen to have a look at. But obviously, as well, Helen, you know, Bruce is on hand to give you some advice from a distance if you just feel like you just need that kind of added comfort. You know, we've all been there. We've seen what we do on social media, and it's unfortunate that not enough people have the opportunity that these guys do to talk to yourself, Bruce. And you know, we never want to find ourselves in a position where family members are putting pressure on the fur mum to to give up the fur baby because. You know, the, the necessary wasn't put in place yeah. first. Yeah, it's, first that, but that, it's completely unavoidable. You know, it's, I think it's always if it's, I'm very much I'm I'm very non-judgmental. You know, if uh, um, if somebody says to me that they want to rehome their dog because they're not coping, that's their that's entirely up to them, and it's likely it's the best thing for the dog anyway. But 
if we do things now and we, we nail it just now, we can prevent that need ever arising. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you want to go and grab your dog and then just show us yes, those? Yes, I'll go and grab one of them quickly and show you the ear touches. Yeah. Okay, guys, so we've got a little bit more of Bruce's time. I've got one question in particular from the comment stream that I want to cover. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys the opportunity now, if you've got an urgent question that you want to get answered, put them in the comments now. Bruce is gonna show us very quickly um, his, his uh, method, which I'm really excited to see because it's not something I've heard of before. Um, so yeah, get your comments in now um, if you want us to try and cover those off. Um, and we will try our very best to do so. Anything we can't cover off today, this is going to become a regular feature. I'm so excited for this. So anything we're not able to cover off today, guys, we will be covering off in a, a session very, very soon. Okay, brilliant. So here we go. Who's that? Oshi. This is my eldest Japanese Shiba Inu. He's the <laughs> favorite camera shy just now. He's my absolutely beautiful boy. He's my pride and joy. Absolutely love him. Um, so I'm going to show you just quickly how to do it, how we do the ear tea touch. Um, so what you do is you place your, your thumb and uh, just right on the back of your dog's ear like this. And we do a circle and a quarter and then we slide up to the tip. If your dog has longer ears, then you'll maybe want to do it um, maybe halfway along, then along. Oh, we've just lost. Oh, just... Sorry, that was a phone call Back. coming in. Sorry. Um, That's all right. So, but, but yeah, so just a, um, so the your, your two fingers on the inside, your thumb on the outside, circle and a quarter, and then slide up to the tip. And it's really, really relaxing for dogs and for for humans as well. So it can help loads. It can help loads with them. Um, uh, a lot of people uh, uh, suggested do uh, do it to their dogs during. Um, uh, fireworks during firework season and it really helped the dogs just chill out a wee bit so definitely recommend doing that okay brilliant so just had a couple of questions going before i have to lose you because we've only had got an hour of your time i did just say to everybody anything you're not able to cover you and i will have a chat and try yeah. very much to get something else going um yeah. there have been a few more comments about barking those that are asking questions about barking we did cover these off at the very very beginning when this this video finishes, you'll have the chance to watch the replay because Bruce gave some amazing tips that can be used across the board, whether it's TV, you know, inside the house or or outside. Okay, so let's have a look here. So there's a lovely lady that I want to find who's got an issue. I'm just going to kind of do the narrative because I know the detail yeah. whilst I find the comment. There's a lady who's got an issue with the dog wetting herself every single night and it's also getting the dog upset. The dog's not very old. It seems to be an incontinence issue, but the yeah. dog looks quite ashamed of herself when she does it, but it's every night. Oh, the wee soul, poor wee pet. Um, can we, can we, do we know how, do, how, how old the dog is and has she been neutered? I'm just going to bear with me one minute and I'll just try and see if the lady is online. I think I'm really, really hoping she still is. It was Trisha Peacock. Trisha, if you're there... Please, can you let us know how old is Coco and has she been neutered? Um, so there's a, a, there's a common link between um, early neutering in dogs and incontinence. Sorry, early neutering in, um, in bitches and incontinence. Um, I think... I'd, I think it's uh, if it's done before their first season because their first season causes their um, muscles around their bladder to, to strengthen a bit. Um, so it's just for anybody else with younger dogs there out there considering it might be worth your while um, just bearing that in mind before you do consider neutering. Um, but I say I think that this, this sounds more, if it's incontinence, um, so the, the by definition incontinence is uncontrollable um, and that's a physical, that's a a, a, a physical aspect of the dog, um, as opposed to behavioural. Um, the if you're so, I mean, I can certainly help you with the fact that she's concerned about. You know, she's showing that she's um, upset by it. The best thing you can do is just not make a big deal about it at all. Um, quite often, because dogs don't. Well, as far as we know, it's changing all the time. 
what emotions dogs dogs feel. Um, but as far as we know just now, dogs don't feel guilt. And that look of that guilty look that they get is actually um, because we walk into a room and we see that there's piss on the floor. And uh, sorry, uh, sorry, excuse my French. Um, sorry, I don't want to do that here. Okay, um, I've not let any f bombs go yet, so we're fine. Um, so we, uh, so we, we see the, the the pee on the floor, and are immediately, without even though we don't shout at the dog, we don't say anything to them, but we immediately are like, oh god, come on, I need to clean this up again, and so that can sometimes be enough to cause the dog to then start acting and um, start. Uh, start uh, acting a bit more fearful and kind of sheepish, um, but it's uh, that that. So the, the best thing you can do is just be as cheery as you can, cleaning up your dog's pee, and um, that will if, because if it is a physical, um, if it's physical incontinence that she's suffering from, um, it's it'll be really unpleasant for her. So if uh, if we can make it as easy for her as we possibly can by being cheery when we're cleaning up cheery when we're cleaning up her pee um it will really really help and obviously seeing uh, then in the uh, I, I, as you know well that's just something to do in the meantime but my my um priority would be to get a proper a good uh, thorough going over by uh uh, at the vet, just to make sure that there's that there's nothing to, well, to check first of all, to see if there's any physical reason that this is happening. Do they use the eye or something, or do they just tend to last for a short period of time? As far as I'm aware, I mean, I'm, I'm not vet trained at all. We do look at during the behaviour study. We do look a lot at the um, the the behaviour and. Uh, pharmacology and also um, physical issues as well. Um, but as far, just from my own knowledge, I think a UTI is generally more short term, um, but I'm, I'm not too sure. Okay, not to worry. Um, hope you've got that there, lovely. If you could just let us know if there's anything, obviously more than we can do, but I think Bruce would give me the best advice that, you know, it's one of those situations and probably needs a bit of a vet um, advice rather than a behavioural, but obviously just ignoring as we do with puppies and just addressing the situation. Pet, vet, pet, I know that you're a big fan of the cleaning bundle. It just sounds a little bit like something we're just going to have to kind of accept um, until we've obviously got the right answers from your vet. Okay, I'm going to. And it's, uh, if, it, if it turns out as behavioural, come straight back to us, and we can we can look at that. Um, but I, I would say if it's uh, if it is incontinence, then it's um, uh, likely it's more likely that there's something underlying there that's causing it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm just going to take one final question for Bruce before we have to say goodnight for the evening. And this is something I know has affected quite a few. So, Cookie has does a strange behaviour with men only. My husband, my dad, my father-in-law. She goes flat on her tummy and crawls, looks submissive, but I want her to feel secure about people when they visit. Is this a normal behaviour? So I'm touching upon, I know that there is definitely, even with some dogs, when they've been born into the house... They can have fear over a gender. It's not always rescue dolls. What would yeah. your advice be for Cookie's mum? I'm pro. I mean, so if she's actually approaching them, um, so she's approaching the the scary people, the scary men. Um, it sounds like she's maybe so she's more open to interacting with them. And um, the fact that she's going over her belly in a kind of army crawl style, I'm assuming that you're talking about, it isn't a it isn't necessarily submissive behaviour. Um, it's a, it's a, it can often be it, it varies from dog to dog really. Um, but what I would probably get then, oops. Oh, she's done. Um, so what I would get the, if we can get the men in your house to, and it's, if, if, uh, if was it, sorry, was the dog called Coco? Cookie, cookie sorry. Oh, it's cookie, cookie, sorry. And so we, if, uh, it's, because Cookie's approaching the men for interaction, it doesn't sound like she's um, too fearful. So it's so fearful that we'd maybe need to consider um, other behaviour protocols, first of all. Um, so I would, possibly just start go go straight into getting the men in your life to interact with her um using by training so teaching her anything that she could anything new at all um is so over teaching her to down to paw to high five to spin anything uh, absolutely anything that you can 
small. Absolutely. Building relationship, confidence, and asso positive associations just by through learning together, build, uh, building them to the uh, building those relationships. Um, to go out in walks together is also a great thing. Probably suggest that we always make sure that you're there as well, um, just so that she doesn't feel that she's trapped at any point. It's just like, oh, Jesus, I really don't, I don't want to be out with these men and I've got no choice. Um, so, but I, 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 so making sure that we've got, she's got somebody that she's comfortable with along for, for the walk as well. Um, but I think primarily I would be looking at um, just building, getting them to do ge any general types of training with her and avoiding... Um, because uh, I know, I think we, there's a, so a lot of people will shout at their dogs if they've done something wrong or, or anything like that at all. Personally, I don't advocate these training techniques and because I, I class myself as um, what we call a progressive reinforcement trainer, which means um, we use a uh, lima, it's called its least, uh, least intrusive, minimally aversive techniques primarily starting with positive reinforcement. Um, but what that doesn't mean that we are permissive. So it doesn't mean that I just let my dogs get away with whatever the fudge they want. Uh, you know, that's not what, the, what, it, what uh, this type of training is about at all. But it's just be, because your dogs, are, because Cookie's already seems to be, have a little bit of an aversion towards men, um, I would just I try and make sure that nobody's, uh, nobody's, shouting at her or giving her a row for something or anything like that at all because your relationship with your dog is like a bank account this is a, an analogy that dr susan friedman uses and it's terrific so your relationship with your dog is like a bank account so all the good stuff that we do just increases your bank the, the, the balance in your bank account we need to take the dog to the vet we make a withdrawal from that bank account but it's still in the happy zone we're still we're not in the overdraft yet so that's fine but Cookies sounds like she's kind of bordering on the dipping into her overdraft with men a little bit, a wee bit. Yeah, so, so Cookie, sorry, Bruce. So Cookie's no mum, she doesn't think it helps that the husband works away as well. So maybe yeah, not. Okay. Yeah, I thought, and I think so. Was um, so our dad was another another one. So we yeah. need to get, get our dad around more. So that's probably that's possibly contributed to it. The fact that Cookie's dad hasn't been around uh, or hasn't been around as consistently as she when she's been going through up and she's been uh, sorry when she's been growing up and going through these really important developmental stages through puppyhood and adolescence sorry that was my phone going again um, but we, we could, it doesn't matter if the regardless of the age of the dog we can still change the behavior um, but I would say just getting, if we can, get uh, Cookie's granddad involved and or any male friends that we've got, these kind of things, uh, these kind of people, um, get them a wee bit more involved. It'll just help. And then when, as soon as dad's home, him getting right back into it for, uh, if he's two weeks on, two weeks off, then that's two weeks that he can spend at home working with Cookie to build her confidence with him. Thank you so much, Bruce. Bruce, you've been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for your time, because I know how busy you very much are. It was um, my pleasure. i just like to say thank, first of all, um, it was a huge honour to uh, actually be asked. You know, I've been a fan of uh, Frank and Jellies for a long time. Um, love what you guys do. So thank you so much for inviting me on board. And a uh, big thank you to everybody in the group for the lovely warm welcome as well um, when the announcement was made. So... It was very much appreciated. Can't look yeah. what we're going to be doing. Brilliant. Well, I think the next question we, you and I need to have is when are you coming back? Yes. So, let's, <laughs> so everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Really excited to have had you here for our very first session. This is going to become a regular that as and when Bruce can fit us into his busy diary, uh, like I did say, there's a couple of comments on here that are obviously like there are some more um, high risk cases. I will contact those people separately to give you Bruce's contact details to have uh, discussions. And also, like I said, anybody who wants to talk to Bruce, he, he does do Skype sessions. He doesn't need to be with you physically. Um, we have just lost Bruce. I think his, his line's just gone. But thank you so much for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Give us a little love heart if you have, um, so we know that you've had a good time. I will get another event set up ASAP, and we will catch up with you very soon. I'm going to take a quick little break, and I will be back with you in the group shortly. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.